Um, ladies and gentlemen, welcome to our uh, last session of the Metro's Panel of the Mechanics in this semester. And the speaker is usually uh, Zata from the Institute of Information Theory and Information. So, usually, is uh, an expert in variational and non truth analysis. And today, he will speak on the application of the tennis moves. My thoughts on the information. Um, um, so, what I just want to do is on the second time. Good afternoon. And many thanks to the organizer for giving me this opportunity to talk after two and a half years again in this seminar. Actually, my last lecture was also devoted to a non smooth smooth method or a smooth method for the solution of inclusions. But this lecture is very different from what I have been talking two years ago. Namely, we have very much improved the method with my quarters, and also the class of application will be different than as my last lecture. Okay, so this is a joint work with two quarters. Helmut Freire is a professor at the Johannes Kepler University in Linz. And Jan Waldmann is my co worker from our institute, the Academy of Sciences. And the talk is based on a paper which has been accepted in set value analysis and published electronically three weeks ago. Well, this is the outline. So I will start with a small, short background on variation analysis in order to recall some important notions. And then I will spend some time with the theory of SED mappings. These mappings actually is the main novelty in our method with respect to the version which I have been uh, discussing here two years ago. Then uh, the next two points, the next two items uh, deal with the method itself. So I will explain first the so-called approximation step and then present this general conceptual scheme of, of the method. And finally, I will switch to the applications, uh, speak about variation inequalities of the second kind, and present a numerical experience with such a problem related to some economic models. Well, so concerning the background from variation analysis, I assume that. A is a uh, oh, A is a set in RS. Everything will be finite dimensional. X bar is a point from this set, and we assume that A is local, closed around X bar. And in this setting, we <coughs> introduce actually three important approximating columns. The first one, this TAX bar, it's a standard boolean or contingent or tangent cone, uh, which is in any textbook about optimization. And since we are in finite dimensions, uh, it's uh, negative polar. This one. It's a normal cone, and we will call it regular or also fresh normal call to A at X bar. And finally, if we compute this Lima superior, it stands for the fine level upper or outer limit of these fresh regular cones, we arrive 
at this so called limiting or many college normal cone denoted NAX bar without head. And to illustrate it quickly, if we have non-convex set A, which consists just from these two half lines, this is our point of the bar. Then the tangent cone looks exactly in the same way, but of course here we are in the origin. This is the tangent cone. And the bar. Now uh, we, we compute the negative polar. <laughs> the non convex set, but this polar is, of course, polar. And it is exactly the mount left outcome. And finally, to construct the monocoat, limiting normal code, we must consider sequences tending to the point in question by being all the time in the graph, in the set A itself, so that when uh, for them <clears throat> converging from here along the half line, we get a vertical line here, we get a horizontal line, and if we consider a stationary sequence in the zero point, then we again get this bottom. So this is a limiting normal cone in this particular case. Uh, in our uh, in my presentation, I will be working with multifunctions, set value mappings. And so we need to characterize in a suitable way uh, behavior of these mappings around a given point. And uh, this is typically done by using of so called generalized derivatives, derivatives and co derivatives. So, here I will be working with only two of them. So, we have a certain multifunction F. Assume that graph of F is locally closed around some point, x bar, y bar from the graph. And <coughs> Uh, then we define the so called regular or fresh derivative, which is given by this formula uh, by working with this uh, regular normal cone to the graph at the point in question. So that to actually uh, we work with the previous definition and apply it to the graph of the multifunction. And the same happens also when speaking about the limiting co-derivative, where we use, instead of uh, regular normal cones, we use the limiting norm. Fine. And now I switch to a very important notion of semi-smoothness. This notion has been introduced by Robert Mifflin in the 70s in connection with uh, non smooth optimization methods, but then it had been widely it had been widely used in so called semi smooth Newton methods, which are now more or less a standard tool for solution of uh, Lipschitzian equations. Here we we present a slightly different uh, <coughs> definition in which we generalize the old notion in two ways. First, uh, this definition allows us to define this property not only for single valued mapping, mappings like it was in the previous Mifflin uh, definition, but also to sets and multifunctions. And second, this property called semi-smoothness star is a little bit weaker than the uh, original one. So that <clears throat> it's of course advantages if we 
imply that we have to impose a weaker uh, requirement. And allow me to illustrate this property by means of such a set. Well, it is the correct word. Well, assume that uh, our point X bar here, this X tilde, I apologize, lies on the smooth part of the boundary. <coughs> so we consider points X tending to X bar along this boundary, because if we go through the interior of this set, all normal points are zero. So it, it will not be a, uh, a contribution. But if we uh, go along the boundary, so you see that I have to use this one. This uh, normal vector and this vector x minus x bar become more and more perpendicular. And this is the very sense of, of this semi smoothness property. And it's interesting that this property actually, in this case, hold also in this king point and also in this rather non regular king point in this corner. And uh, it turns out that this semi smoothness star property is not restricted. So in particular, it, it holds for every mapping whose graph is a union on five finitely many close convex sets. So that here we see the, for the whole set is a semi smooth star. But it uh, actually it holds for a rather difficult set. It can, uh, and uh, a French mathematician, Giovanni, uh, actually has shown that this property holds for any closed analytic set. And this is already a very low uh, <coughs> class of sets. Fine. I can pass to the theory of these SCD mappings. So assume we are in, the, in, this, in this Cartesian product Rm and time Rm, and we consider n dimensional subspaces of this product space. And the space of all such subspaces will be denoted by script L with the index M. Uh, excuse me, generally it is uh, covered by this picture, but we, we write script L, M, and it, <coughs> it's, uh, I speak about the spaces from Rn from this Cartesian class. And uh, if n is m, you will write only Ln. And of course, such subspaces can be represented in a different way. So one possibility which we use extensively is uh, this one with, with the range of these of the of a matrix which is composed from these matrices B1 and B2. They have these the dimensions n times n, m times n, and we this matrix, this composition or the, <coughs> this whole matrix has to have its full column rank, which is n, in order to ensure our uh, assumption or our requirement that we consider only spaces which which uh, <coughs> are only subspaces L which are n dimension. Now, <coughs> with each L, we may associate an adjoint subspace, and uh, this is generated via orthogonal complements to L. So you see the definition here. 
So first we construct this orthogonal complement, and then we make this switch of variables uh, accompanied with the change of sign. And this change is actually the, exactly the same like in the construction of the code area. So, and everything is done in this way because if our mapping later is, say, a linear mapping <clears throat> defined by a matrix A, then the adjoint matrix, adjoint mapping in this. <clears throat> Uh, relationship uh, is a transpose. So, in order to ensure this, we, we make this switch of variables. Fine. Okay. And the relationship between L, uh, the, the orthogonal complement, and the adjoint space is provided here in the last row. And uh, this matrix S and M exactly realizes this switch of variables. <clears throat> now, it is possible to uh, equip uh, this space or subspaces by a metric. One possibility how to do it, it is described here. Namely, if we have these two subspaces are one two, so we construct the corresponding matrix defining the orthogonal projection onto these subspaces, and then we uh, define our distance as the difference of these two matrices, and we take an arbitrary matrix norm from being something else. And uh, <clears throat> the construction of these uh, projectors is not too difficult because we, we have to be disposed very much, very often with this representation via this matrix as a range of this matrix Z. And if we take such a matrix Z that this condition holds, then the projector is automatically given uh, in, in this way. And uh, now uh, we observe that when working with this metric, our space L and M or LN is a sequentially compact metric space, which is very important when building the calculus, etc., uh, uh, which will be partially mentioned in the sequence. And in particular, uh, based on this matrix, we can define, in fact, four different derivative-like objects working in this uh, in these spaces. And for our, my lecture today, we will need just two of them. <clears throat> Before I introduce them, let me define. Let me say that. Uh, our some multifunction f mapping Rn into Rm is called graphically smooth of dimension n, provided first x bar y bar belongs uh, to the graph of f, and second uh, the tangent cone to the graph of f at the point x bar y bar belongs to this space. It means it's a subspace of the right dimension. And to show you how it works, maybe I can, okay, but not. So, assume that we are given, for instance, the absolute value of And we compute it some different mapping. And so this looks as follows. This looks like this. And this is test check. And uh, now 
whenever we are we have so x variable whenever x is positive then we have to do with a smooth function which is constant and of course in any of these points on the graph uh, the tangent space uh, or the normal space uh, both of them are subspaces so concerning the normal cone it amounts exactly to a uh, horizontal to a vertical and we, if we are in this point of the graph lying on this horizontal line then normal cone is actually looks like that so that it again satisfies the uh, definition so that in fact uh, we have to do with the mapping uh, i forgot to say that we denote by a script o of f the subset of the graph where uh, this graphically smoothness holds so in this case you can see that, you see that uh, this uh, multifunction is graphically smooth at all points of its graph apart from this view. Okay, so I will now define two derivative like objects. Okay. Which we will which we will use. And the first one is actually here. And it's a mapping which assigns to each pair x, y, x and y uh, this graph of, of the uh, regular co-derivative. And we know that if x and y belong to the set OF, then this graph is nothing else than our subspace L having the right dimension. So this mapping is either a linear subspace or an empty set. <coughs> and uh, now what happens if, we, if x and y doesn't belong to the set O of F? In that case, uh, we will be working with this mapping S star of S, where we uh, <coughs> assign, associate with X and Y, a whole family of subspaces, which we obtain uh, by We, uh, which we obtain in this way we let a sequence of points xk yk converge to our point in question in the set o of f and take the limit of the uh, corresponding subspaces so what does it mean in this example <coughs> Assume that we consider this point, which, as I said, doesn't belong to this point. Now, <clears throat> here, the <clears throat> uh, in all these points, the regular co-derivative uh, is graph amounts to a horizontal line. So that in, in the limit, we obtain the again a horizontal line. But we also may consider the sequence tending to this point from here. And then in all these situations, this derivative amounts to the vertex. So that the, the set and the value of, of this S star F in this case, it amounts to the union of these two subspaces. Fine. And now I can finally proceed to the main definition of this part, namely this STD property. And uh, before I do this, do this, 
are observed that always the, the, the value of this adjoint collection of adjoint spaces is S star F at the point X is a subset of, of the graph of the limiting coderiva. So it's a proper subset in many say, situations. So therefore, uh, we, uh, the definition is as follows. Our multifunction F is said to have the SED property at a point X, Y from its graph, provided this limiting collection of subspaces defined in this way is non-empty. And uh, <clears throat> we will call F a CD mapping if it has this SED property at all points. And uh, this SED is an abbreviation, an acronym for a subspace containing derivative. And this should actually indicate exactly these properties here. This one, namely, in this coderiva, in this left hand side, we have a collection of subspaces which belong to the limiting coderiva. While I move further and define a certain regularity notion. You know, in good methods, generally, we, we need not smooth move method. We need two properties to ensure this uh, superlinear convergence, local superlinear convergence. Namely, the semi smoothness, which I have already mentioned, and a part of it, some kind of regularity. And in, in the classical good method, we must require non singularity of the Jacobian. And here, this property is, of course, also necessary, and uh, it is, uh, say, supplied by the notion of SCB regularity. So we are, we have a certain set of spaces. So first, uh, we call. Uh, <coughs> Uh, we <clears throat> having a fixed subspace L. So we, uh, the, the requirement will be if Y star zero belongs to this L, then Y star must be zero. In a simple one-dimensional situation means that L is not a horizontal, you can imagine. And uh, of course, in more dimensions, the property cannot be described in, a, in such a simple way. <laughs> and uh, so uh, the definition uh, two says, a mapping F is called SED regular around a point from its graph, provided first uh, this mapping has the SED property around the point. And in addition, whenever the pair y star zero belongs to L, then y star must be zero. And this must hold for all subspaces L from this collection of subspaces. So that, this is a certain regularity notion. And uh, we may, using if our F is a CD regular SCD <coughs> mapping, then we can also a little bit weaken, weaken this uh, semi smoothness property, which I proposed at the beginning, which results in this notion of SCD semi smoothness. But you don't need to look carefully at the definition. Uh, the simplest way in application is just to apply the classical notion of semi smoothness. And only if it doesn't hold, then we can think about some weakenings. Fine. Now, <clears throat> our aim, as I already mentioned, it is to solve inclusion of the form <clears throat> zero 
belongs to the f of x, where <coughs> f is the multiple. So the t one to find an x such that its image contains zero vectors. And uh, <coughs> of course, uh, there are also other methods uh, which are able to, to solve such a problem. So the oldest one comes from a, a student of Steve Robinson from Wisconsin, and uh, his name was Josephy, and uh, he suggested actually such a method for the case, and F is so zero belongs. Here we have some single values mapping plus multi values mapping different Q of X. And we speak about generalized equation. And his idea was actually to linearize for the Newton method only the single values part in a standard way. And he uh, left. left uh, this multivalent part intact. Uh, it seems to be a little bit strange, but nevertheless, uh, this method found some good applications. And the other methods which are listed here, they also, uh, they, they also, of course, linearize the single valent part, but they also approximate, in a certain sense, the multivalent. And to this purpose, they are working with these uh, tangent cones, which I have mentioned at the beginning, mainly. But uh, it has a drawback that uh, this technique, uh, there is a very poor calculus for tangent objects in variation analysis. So that it, it pays actually to switch to the dual space and work with uh, these limiting objects, limiting cone derivatives. And this is exactly what we will do next. So another thing which is common in all these methods, is a problem which I can easily demonstrate as a figure. So assume that we have such a multi-function. And this is the solution. So we may be very close to the solution point, but the set f of x, which is here, this is the point x, and this is the point, this is the point x bar. And we can observe that for x is very close to the solution, the value of image f of x can be an answer. So this is very bad, actually, if uh, <clears throat> we cannot guarantee the non-emptiness of f of x close to the point in question. But what we can do it is the following. If we are here, for instance, then we can project uh, our x onto the graph and the considered multi-function f. This may be costly, but it also can be done in an economic way. And we speak about so-called approximation. What we need in order to ensure the convergence, we need to ensure this inequality here, this one, which I have depicted <coughs> also here, so that here our graph of F, it is uh, <coughs> clear what I what meant. Uh, the solution X bar is also clear. And now assume that we are in this point XK, the K iteration, and uh, we perform a certain projection. And this needn't be an exact projection. We just need that the projected point, this x tilde k, y tilde k, that 
it's uh, one can estimate the blue line segment uh, via the red side line segment. Yeah. And this is sufficient so that one, one has to arrange this approximation step in such a way that it is possibly cheap and satisfies such a inequality. And now I can proceed to an implement uh, to a conceptual uh, version of our method. So uh, we have a certain starting point x0, put k equal zero, and then test uh, whether zero belongs to f of x k. This is the stopping moment. If yes, okay, we are done and uh, we stop. If not, then we first perform this approximation step. Means we compute uh, a, a proje approximate projection of xk onto the graph of f and require here this step is of course difficult that the limiting collection of subspaces at this projection point contains some subspace which is regular in the sense of this non-horizontality. Uh, Having this, we take such a subspace from this intersection. This step is called the Newton step. And it is now possible to, <coughs> that this space which we have chosen has the representation via the matrices BK transpose AK transpose. And uh, <clears throat> having these matrices, the whole thing is just the solution uh, of a linear square system with non singular matrix. The non singularity is due to the assumed regularity. And we obtain the next iteration xk plus one in, in this way. Then we up the uh, k to k plus one, and so this is of course a conceptual algorithm uh, for each class of problems uh, of this type. We have to elaborate uh, in a suitable way, especially this uh, approximation step and the Newton step. What about conversions? So you see, we need that f is semi-smooth or SCD semi-smooth as a solution point. And in addition, it must be SCD regular around this point. And then the claim is that for every positive scalar eta, which specifies the inequality in the approximation step, there is a neighborhood U of the solution point X bar such that for every starting point belonging to this uh, neighborhood, this algorithm is well defined at stop either after finitely many iterations at X bar or produces a sequence XK which converges superlinearly to X bar for any choice uh, in the new step. We uh, actually for for any choice of x k tilde uh, no x hat k y hat k satisfying this inequality in the approximation step and any choice of the subspace l k belonging to this uh, collection of geometry and uh, you, you see a difference in the <coughs> Previous uh, uh, description of the algorithm, we require here that this, uh, this condition holds, and then we take a subspace from this collection of subspaces, which is regular. Whereas here, if we assume the regularity, uh, SCD regularity from the very beginning, so then we can take an eye 
okay. So we don't need to take care of the choice. Fine. So let me move further. No more. This is not. Okay. Let us apply now this general conjectural scheme to variation in natural voices of the second class. So, and first, we consider only the case when capital F has such a, a structure. So we have to solve a generalized equation in the sense of Robinson. In order to facilitate the approximation step, it is advantages. If we replace the problem zero belongs to f of x by this one, um, in which we actually decouple, it's a decoupled version of the above generalized equation. You see in the first row, we have different variables here, and here we have x, and here we have d. And of course, we must ensure that x equal d, d so that uh, therefore we have this second line here okay it's primitive but nevertheless it facilitates the approximation step and you will see uh, the outcome in a minute and in order to be uh, to, to discuss variation inequalities of the second kind we assume that the multifunction is nothing else than the classical moral rotational differential of a certain proper convex law standard continuous uh, function Q. Then we know, okay, our problem is a variation of inequality of the second kind. Actually, here it is written down. So such a generalized, such a variation of inequality. And now, for the description of this approximation step, I will need the definition of the proximal mapping. Do you know proximal mapping? Okay, it's not a more or less standard way or standard notion, namely, given a certain function q, which is proper convex and lower semi-continuous, then its proximal mapping uh, with respect to parameter lambda, which is assumed to be positive, is defined in this way so that it's uh, arc of min, min, arc min of a, another function, which is strictly convex so that the proximal mapping is, is really single valued. And uh, you see we minimize with respect to x so that the proximal mapping is a <coughs> function of y. And uh, well, in some situation, the proximal mapping can be computed rather very easily. In some other situations, it's, it is not that easy. And, uh, but it will be very helpful in our uh, <coughs> application area. And the last uh, statement before I uh, <coughs> will describe uh, the implemented version of our algorithm, it is here. So it facilitates, this was important, the previous statement was to, for important for the approximation step. This one is useful for the Newton step. And the statement is as follows. So we have some Q. Uh, we, uh, it holds definitely that the subdifferential of Q is an SCD mapping. It's a non-trivial statement. But as you see here, for instance, uh, it's work at least in some situation. And uh, for every subspace L coming from this uh, limiting collection of subspaces, 
which is uh, for any L that exists a matrix B with some remarkable properties, namely it's symmetric, positive, definite, and uh, its norm is less or equal to one, such that this uh, space, the subspace generated by this matrix is given as a range of B and identity minus B. So the, it, it facilitates the computation of objects appearing in the Newton And now we have an implementable version of our algorithm. So <clears throat> we choose some stopping tolerance epsilon, some starting point put k equals zero, and then <clears throat> Right. This is the approximation step. Step two. <coughs> we uh, compute this projection, this approximate projection by formulas which are here in this line, where u, first we have to compute u, and u is this proximal mapping, this one. And it has been defined in this row here. So, okay, it could be that the computation of this U would be difficult. I don't blame anything else. But then the update is very simple. And only after the approximation step, we apply the, or we <coughs> test uh, the satisfaction of the stopping rule. And so we compute the norm of this vector, which is not difficult. And uh, having this epsilon, we either stop the algorithm or proceed farther. And now, uh, on the basis of this matrix B, it is not difficult to compute this, these matrices X star, Y star, uh, which we need. Uh, in order to uh, construct this linear system, this one, which is a square linear system with a regular or non-singular matrix. It, we have to solve it, and then we get the Newton direction delta xk and uh, proceed further. So, okay. This is now an implementable algorithm, but nevertheless, uh, this implementation has uh, requires some additional work. And what, what else? What about conversions? Uh, uh, <clears throat> we, in this algorithm, we are also working with this quantity kappa. Uh, actually, the gamma, this one, uh, which is a certain scaling factor for the approximation step. In fact, what I did always, I have put gamma equal one and it worked quite well. But according to my quarter, uh, sometimes it improves if we adjust this gamma a little bit. And that's why this conversion statement attains this form, namely, uh, we suppose, of course, the STG regularity around this point, and we also assume that our gamma, this, uh, the adjustment of the approximation step must lie between these two values. And that's why, uh, okay, this is simple to be endured. And then the claim is that algorithm two produces a sequence XK converging super, converging super linearly to the solution for whenever we <coughs> choose this gamma K from this interval. Well, uh, this, this is a, actually just a small complication, without nothing more. But the real problem is 
to compute this proximal mapping, the value of the proximal mapping. And uh, <clears throat> for given uh, scaling parameter gamma, we solve such a problem here in this approximation step. And uh, <clears throat> you see this problem is strictly convex thanks to the presence of this guy here, but it is non-smooth due to the uh, non-smoothness of this Q function. It can be an <coughs> indicatory function or something else, for instance, the sum of such an abs absolute value time function plus an indicatory function, etc. But in most cases, the structure is so simple that we can construct a convex nonlinear programming, which is equivalent to this one and which can be solved using the standard software. Fine, a few remarks are in order. So very often this Q of X has such a decomposable structure mentioned at uh, the uh, top of the and then, in fact, this uh, optimization problem from the last slide actually decomposes, fully decomposes into, uh, here we have L uh, summons, so it decomposes in, the, uh, in L optimization problems, which may be rather low dimension, for instance. So this is a favorite structure if we can choose. And uh, concerning the stopping loop, then uh, it is important to see that this guy uh, whose norm we compute actually amounts exactly to the residuum of our generalized equation. So that uh, it's actually, it's beautiful. We, we dispose with the residuum and uh, it can be also used not only as a stopping criterion, but if we, for instance, think about the globalization of this method, this could be a merit function, etc. Or damping. This is a useful uh, situation. And finally, uh, <clears throat> uh, we observe that uh, this equation which we saw solved in the Newton step, it is uh, actually only a system of n uh, linear equations. So that uh, at the beginning, you remember, we have doubled the number of variables in order to simplify the uh, approximation step. It is at the first glance a disadvantage, but finally in the Newton step, we, we have the original dimension, and so it doesn't bring any additional complexity. Well, and uh, so let me let me how, well, how much time I have? Yeah, no, I mean, maybe just thirty minutes. So. Okay, yeah. then I can a little bit describe what we So <clears throat> once we have written a paper with so much or under the yeah. help of so much with Waldman about the economic problems, which amounts in fact to a mesh per game uh, with non smooth uh, utility functions for the single players. And it turns out that uh, this uh, it, it's a not potential problem, of course, as a mesh game. And uh, it's difficult because the problems of the single players, all of them are non-smooth. The non-smoothness is not very fundamental, but it's present, nevertheless. And uh, in the first version of the paper uh, dealing with these problems, we demonstrated the effectiveness of our method by some mechanical problems like contact problems with stress cup friction, etc. And uh, actually, 
the paper was rejected uh, with <coughs> the, uh, say reasoning that all these problems are too simple because uh, one can solve them cheaply by different methods, first order method where one iteration is much, much cheaper than this one. And uh, uh, they, in particular, mention this class of so called splitting method. Maybe you have heard about our backward Douglas Redford methods. They, they indeed uh, are able, in most cases, to solve these problems, but in a huge number of iterations. Okay, never this was. Uh, uh, the conclusion for uh, our reviewer. So we were looking for a problem where these uh, <coughs> uh, splitting methods have difficulties. And <coughs> actually, the best class was the class of these uh, mesh games, where I will show you in a minute. They, uh, they, the splitting method indeed have extreme difficulties, or they collapse completely. And uh, the, the situation in the economic model behind this uh, <coughs> you know, application is as follows. So we have an oligopolistic market. We have their end producers and firms. They produce M commodities, and uh, <coughs> now they observe they are in a certain equilibrium state, and suddenly uh, the external parameters change. For instance, the prices of inputs increase. So, in such a way, uh, in such a situation, they have recompute the, the equilibrium, and uh, they can appropriately change their production or their portfolio of production, but they have to take into account that each change in this portfolio is uh, actually associated with some additional cost. So that's, that's clear, more or less. Maybe some small firms uh, do not need uh, to pay this additional uh, expense, but most firms have to do it. And uh, this additional cost is a non smooth function. And uh, that's why we have at the beginning actually solved such a simple situation. And this was computed by Jan Badman, namely US five firms, uh, each of which produces three types of commodities. And what we have to do with 15 variables. And uh, then, actually, the simplest version of our uh, of this method of this semi-smooth style SCD method produced in all situations such a, a similar figure like this one. So that here we have the value of the equilibrium of the residuum, and uh, this is the number of iterations. So you see clearly the number of superlinear converges. But then we wanted really to compare our results with those first order methods. And so we have increased very, very much the dimensionality of the problem. So here you have three groups of problems. In the first group, we have to do with 200 producers, each of which produces five commodities. And vice versa, in the group three, we have just five producers, but 200 commodities. And so that the overall number of variables is now 1,000. Of course, it's still not a very high number, but the structure of the problem is difficult. And uh, here you see uh, these so called performance uh, diagrams. And uh, I have three for each group of uh, problems. 
and uh, in the rectangle you see uh, the method which we have used so s as newton is our method and we compare the results with four different splitting algorithms and what you see so partially uh, 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 <coughs> but look at the first first figure so our method uh, it's now globalized uh, globalized version of our Newton method so at the beginning it works similarly like the splitting methods but as soon as we reach our neighbor uh, mentioned in the convergence statement then we find immediately the solution after a few iterations whereas the uh, the splitting algorithm continue their linear convergence and even after uh, 25 seconds it means five times more than we don't see any substantial progress and um actually the, the greatest difference was observed in this uh, third group where we have as you remember five producers and 200 commodities maybe this problem doesn't have any any economic value uh, but it was ideal to demonstrate maybe we can move the, the, I mean, the bar the, the, the ground for you know because yeah I, I, I was really you know I, if I can do it but maybe this one we can uh, oh, perfect no 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 but no still this one here uh, oh, oh no! What? No, this is not good. But no, no. I mean, I think it's, it's good. double click where? On that main picture. Double click. You mean? No, no, no. This this goes. Now I have to go back. No, oh. but now we see. But maybe you know, with the mouse, you can at least move this somewhere. Okay, I, I yeah, now we don't we, see the this is not necessary. Yeah, but we, we are like it is now. So now you see the second figure uh, 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 the intermediate situation, and uh, actually uh, the most uh, expressive is the third figure, uh, where we have just a small amount of producers, very many commodities. Which is actually a complication also for the Newton. But the complication for the splitting algorithm is even much more uh, pregnant. So that uh, you see, they, the, the, the curves or here, this procedure shows that the uh, minimization of the <coughs> The video is negligible, more or less. And uh, we have run them for quite a long time uh, without any success uh, in solving this problem. So maybe it's a little bit unfair for, for this method, but we have uh, definitely uh, encountered a class of uh, problems in which uh, the second order Newton method really uh, beats uh, the, uh, <coughs> the concurrence in a potential way. Fine, I am approaching the end. Thing happened. Maybe please don't go. Okay. No, okay. Arrow. Something happened. I am sorry. Oh, yeah. Maybe, yeah. Okay. I will, what you did? 
Yeah. I think that's that, 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 yeah. no, like maybe here somewhere. No, yeah, yeah. So maybe now go back. Ah, yeah. Okay. So yeah, the references I actually would like only to mention the book of Clutter and Humor, uh, which was already quite old, 20 years old. But uh, before Christmas, I got a message that Ben Kumar uh, passed away on December 15 last year. And so he was expressed as Yadichka always spoke about him as, a, as his best student. And he was also the guy who, who, was a, uh, who introduced the non school new method at all. Uh, in 88. So, in this connection, it is a very good to mention. And concerning the this economic application, it, we, we have uh, used these two references uh, uh, the paper by Shiro Flow and uh, this paper by Morphy, Sharari, and Suster. They have been contract they constructed this equilibrium model but without without the nonsense part so the nonsense part is a novelty and it's complicated of course the computation that's all i think it's